South African Environmental Right. My name is Tanya Wagner. I'm from Nelson Mandela University and will be chairing this session together with Dr. Kislefetse Lefenya from Northwest University. Please be advised that this session is being recorded and all attendees are asked to please make sure that their cameras and microphones are off. Uh, for the purposes of the discussion, uh, we ask that all questions uh, to the respective speakers must please be posted in the chat. Our speakers will present one at a time, after which we will then engage in discussion. Our topic for today is traditional knowledge systems, protected areas, public participation, and marine living resources. I will now hand over to Dr. Lefenia to introduce the speakers and explain the order of proceedings. Good morning, colleagues, and good morning to our lovely presenters and the audience at large. This morning, we are going to have three presentations from three speakers. The first one that I'm going to introduce right now is Isabella Potenza, who is a BA law student at the University of Witwatersrand. Her presentation is titled, Traditional and Indigenous Knowledge and Environmental Law. I will introduce each speaker as he or she comes to the fore. But right now, I'm going to request Isabella to start with her presentation. And also, like Tanya has said, let us wait with the questions. We will do the discussions at the end of all the presentations. Ladies and gentlemen, we were supposed to have four presentations. One has withdrawn. It therefore means that we have five minutes extra that we can give to our three speakers. So the first one being Isabella, you have about 20 minutes for your presentation. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Can you see me? Um, yes, so. we can. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't have a, a PowerPoint, um, so you just have to look at my face. Um, I'm Isabella Potenza from BITS, um, third year BA law student. I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so um, my research is primarily centered around whether the patent is an appropriate legal tool in interacting with indigenous cultural approaches to the ownership and management of natural resources. So the initial basis of this discussion is a comparison of the legal sentiments held a decade ago regarding indigenous knowledge and intellectual property law with a specific focus on the difficulties and complications that this merge creates compared to the current legal sentiments on the same issue. So this comparison can first be seen in both Myberg's work, an intellectual property lawyer who expressed his evaluation in 2011 with regard to the legal developments in the protection of plant-related traditional knowledge, as well as Schenel's work, the human rights lawyer who represented the San community in the famous San Hudia case and who considered in 2013 benefit sharing in light of the introduction of international law with regard to indigenous knowledge, namely the Nagoya Protocol. Both these learned authors express their concerns regarding the legal difficulty that arises with impossible access and benefit sharing agreements, known as ABS. Shennels refers to the difficulty in determining which community holds the indigenous knowledge, how this translates into percentages of share in royalties when multiple communities claim rights to the knowledge, and whether the same communities can be further differentiated into those who actively use the knowledge and original communities where the knowledge came from. 
Another difficulty that arises is the knowledge is not novel due to many years of being shared and sometimes being active in the public forum. So this is one of the aspects that goes directly against the requirements for patents. After almost a decade, there's still an irreconcilable difference between indigenous knowledge and the Western conception of intellectual property. In a policy report published in 2020 by Voices for Biojustice, the same conceptual errors that were expressed 10 years ago regarding access and benefit sharing agreements are still relevant. These include and are not limited to the difficulty in again, neatly defining the specific indigenous community um, that will benefit from a bilateral agreement due to the widespread use of traditional knowledge that has been collectively produced across geographical boundaries, which is a colonial concept in itself, culture and generations. Simply put as who is actually going to benefit and will the preference given to some communities be at the detriment of others. Another difficulty, difficulty is still the, determin the determination of value within the many different contexts and multiple sites of value creation within traditional knowledge from, for example, the cultivation and harvesting of the genetic resources to the uses of the genetic resources. <clears throat> so, Many of the same challenges are being observed by different groups and actors. And an example of a particularly significant group that is expressing these concerns is the Intergovernmental Committee on Intellectual Property and Genetic Resources, Traditional Knowledge and Folklore, which was developed in 2011 under the World Intellectual Property Organization for the very purpose of balancing these different views. Two weeks ago, this community conducted their 41st session where, again, it was expressed one of the key issues that prevents consensus on a number of core issues is, quote, the conceptual divide between how Indigenous communities view the world and that reflected in the intellectual property system based on a Western legal system. So the sentiment was directly reflected in the views of the Indigenous caucus present at the conference who expressed resistance to the concept of ownership over nature. Um, at this point, a brief understanding of the substance behind this legal relationship is necessary. The historical backdrop <clears throat> upon which this complicated relationship lies is that of violent extraction of natural resources, land and indigenous knowledge through colonization. These conditions and consequences created an urgent need for legislation that properly protects indigenous communities and indigenous knowledge. Therefore, the need to regulate knowledge sharing agreements is vital and completely understandable in order to protect communities from any repetition of such extraction, which would now be termed within this context, um, things like biopiracy or the misappropriation of genetic resources. Um, on the other hand, another reason why this, this kind of regulation is relevant and important is the, the, economic, the economic opportunity found in benefit sharing agreements, as well as local biotechnology production using indigenous knowledge, is clearly visible within the South African context, being an immensely biodiverse country, the third most biodiverse in the world, and also holding immense indigenous knowledge. So this is appreciated by the bioeconomy strategy that was adopted in 2014 by the Department of Science and Technology. However, um, it has been observed that these ABS agreements have not brought adequate benefits to holders of indigenous knowledge, and that usually interested companies take the path of least resistance when securing indigenous knowledge, meaning that there may be an adequate legal pro uh, process in practice um, with regards to interacting with Indigenous communities. Another thing to consider is a lot of these, these commercial interests are based on um, health, what you could call health fads. So what tends to happen is the, 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 the product market that these Indigenous communities are entering into by sharing their traditional knowledge um, may not actually benefit them in the long run and, and may not pr prove to be viable investments um, for the companies, um, which, is another, which is another problem when it comes to, when it comes to kind of selling information 
um, and, and seeking benefits that, that may be based on quite shallow interests. Um, and um, yeah, okay. So, um, so now, now where we are is with all that in mind, in light of how these access and benefit sharing processes have played out under the, the current legal frameworks, is this an opportunity for a different direction to be taken possibly? Um, is there perhaps an opportunity to revise these legal frameworks with regard to what may be more appropriate in the circumstances, considering the persistent difficulty that we are facing between indigenous knowledge and intellectual property law? One of the aforementioned difficulties in neatly defining indigenous law regarding genetic resources is that the knowledge is not static and varies in form within different practices. So these characteristics are akin to the mechanisms that are employed in customary law in South Africa, where practices are open to change and adaptation. This is somewhat addressed by Section 83.1F of the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act, otherwise known as the Biodiversity Act, wherein it is stated that the benefit sharing agreement must provide for a regular review of the agreement by the parties as the bioprospecting process progresses. So there isn't an opportunity for some um, reflection on the process and, and possibly um, um, adaptation as it goes along. But this is, this is only a response to one aspect of the process and not the entire process itself. So I believe this is a, definitely an opportunity to create an adaptive legal model that can cater to different circumstances, locations, cultures, practices, and especially different sources of indigenous knowledge with regards to genetic resources. So whether it is the cultivation or harvesting technique or a particular preparation of the genetic resource, how this would be defined and dealt with differently within the law, for example, as opposed to being under a, a blanket legislation that may um, that may not actually um, give equitable um, benefits to the communities that share this, this kind of information. So, so in, in, in all, there needs to be a consideration of the different circumstances and, and a kind of law on its own to deal with all these different circumstances. Um, the last point that I deal with is, is, is a broader point um, that speaks to whether this is an opportunity to critically assess the relative authority of Western law and law within indigenous communities regarding the management and regulation of natural resources. So it is common practice within the legal discipline, as we know, to refer to the expertise of others, whether it be individual experts or organizations that have direct access to the knowledge on a daily basis. So for example, in the courts, you'd get an amicus curie so that there can be guidance in the decision-making and that the, that the court can have an informed view. So I see no difference in this situation where indigenous communities have built up, tried and tested knowledge over generations and therefore have a specific understanding and um, that is of value and that is also of authority when considering how to manage natural resources. Thus, the limited role of indigenous communities um, within benefit sharing agreements could be brought into question. Um, sorry, okay. the limited role of indigenous communities within benefit sharing agreements could be brought into question due to the fact that this role is defined by intellectual property law as acting as a party to a bilateral agreement that ultimately serves a commercial purpose. Um, Moreover, it should be noted that within indigenous communities, there are mechanisms that are in place to protect the knowledge. And so what, it, what position is our law actually in to legislate the protection of indigenous knowledge without a particular consideration and um, like a public participation process or a more inclusive consideration of the views of indigenous communities? And why is this protection based on commercial use of the knowledge and not a legal integration of the knowledge as a form of authority regarding conservation, for example? Um, whilst I acknowledge that this research and these questions may not be novel, I believe that a legal integration of indigenous law to include somewhat of an indigenous regulatory body over natural resources may be something new to consider. 
this kind of legal integration could possibly potentially better serve the purposes of protecting indigenous knowledge as well as natural resources and in some senses pay tribute to or acknowledge the important role of such communities that have conserved natural resources with internal regulating regulating mechanisms for generations this legal approach to indigenous knowledge could also play a role in reframing the knowledge away from the value being found through extractive commercial pr processes that reflect the historical colonization of the knowledge and resources and instead consider the value of the knowledge as an important contribution to the law that could ultimately change how we interact with the environment. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's me. Okay. Thank you very much, Isabella. You have given us a very interesting, very thought-provoking presentation, particularly on the issue of integrating indigenous knowledge and environmental law, something worth thinking about. We still have some few minutes to spare, but we are continuing with the second presentation. <clears throat> Our second presenter is Chiesa Machaka, who is an LLD, a doctoral student at the Northwest University. Her presentation or his presentation is all about legal governance of the commons in promoting social ecological resilience. The South African side of the Kalahadi Transfrontier Conservation Area. I strongly believe that we are going to hear a lot, learn a lot from Chesa Machaka. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everybody. I'm just trying to put my video on. So apologies for that. Can you see me now? Chesa, your sound is very, very low. Yes. We can hardly hear oh, you. Miss Machaka, we can't hear you, but we can see your slide. Miss Machaka? Miss Machaka, we cannot hear you. Can you increase your volume, please? Miss Machaka, try putting your video off. That might help to enhance the audio a bit. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, can you now hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, we can. I, I can sorry. hear you. Greetings. All right, greetings, everybody. And I would like to thank uh, Ila for the opportunity to present today. And uh, my apologies for the bad network connection. Your sound is very low.
Olivia, perhaps we can proceed with the next speaker and then um, Tetsa can sort out a, a mic in the meantime. I agree with the proposal. Ashla Pape, are you ready to present? Whilst um, Mashaka is talking about her connection problems. No problem. Sure, no problem. Somebody's also making noise in the background. Please switch off your mics, please. Yes, I see Ashla is ready. Ashla? Yes, perfect. May I proceed? Ashla, let me introduce you quickly. Thank you. She is an LLM student at the University of Pretoria. And her presentation is titled A Critical Analysis of the Evolution of Public Participation in Environmental Decision Making in the South African Mining Sector. Something that is very, very close to my heart is public participation. Over to you, Ashla. Glad to hear that. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you also for the opportunity to present. Um, right, just to give a bit of an overview of um, what I will be talking about today. Um, the research that I undertook as part of my LLM studies involved how um, an analysis of how the international law principle of free prior and informed consent or ethic can enhance public participation to promote environment, environmental justice for communities that, are, um, that have been affected by environmental decision-making in the mining sector. The presentation um, that I'll be uh, doing today will outline a number of things, including um, providing a brief discussion of key concepts, um, public participation that's required in terms of mining sector environmental regulatory uh, framework in South Africa, public participation required in terms of the interim protection of uh, informal land rights act or IPILRA in the context of mining specifically and, um, and, and in the context of mining right applications and how FPIC or the concept of free prior informed consent was introduced into South African law. And then I'll be looking at aspects relating to uh, the advancement of environmental justice through public participation that includes ethic. So um, environmental justice. So while the concept of environmental justice entails so much more than this brief presentation con can convey, um, for the purposes of the study and this presentation, environmental justice is understood to entail a recognition of the equal moral worth of all people that are impacted by environmental decision. And as such, no group or community is left behind in such processes merely because of their net worth or because of the color of their skin. Environmental justice also includes, um, it includes procedural mechanisms such as public participation, which can be employed to secure the equitable distribution of environmental benefits and burdens associated with development projects. It therefore includes both procedural as well as substantive or distributional elements. This paper proposes that while consultation can facilitate procedural environmental justice, it doesn't advance substantive environmental justice if the affected individuals and communities can say anything except no to proposed developments. according to the definition of Emily Greenspan, is the principle that indigenous people and local communities must be adequately informed about projects in a timely manner and given the opportunity to approve or to reject a project before it begins. Key elements of an FPIC process require that consent must be freely given, in other words, without coercion, that must be fully informed, obtained before permission is granted to proceed um, with a proposed project and that it is based on consent. Engagements or negotiations must be undertaken in the language and in accordance uh, with the laws, 
customs, procedures, protocols, and methods of the respective communities. Cons consequent agreements must be legally binding and enforceable. So public participation is now accepted as an integral part of environmental decision-making processes in, in the South African mining sector. A failure to consult in accordance with the prescribed procedures may render a decision reviewable on the ground that it is procedurally unfair, as was held in the Ben Yama case. But how useful is consultation as a tool to promote environmental justice? To answer this question, it's useful to contextualize consultation within a spectrum of possible activities that can be undertaken as part of a public participation process. In this regard, uh, the IAP2 or uh, International Association of Public Participation has developed a tool to ascertain the appropriate level of engagement when undertaking public participation processes. So on your screen now you'll see the IAP2 spectrum. Um, it details five levels of engagement that uh, include informing, consulting, um, consult, consulting with, involving, collaborating with, and eventually empowering participants. Each level has a corresponding goal and a promise made to participants in the public participation process. Each of the five levels signifies a progressive increase in the degree of influence and decision-making discretion afforded to participants. At the one end of the spectrum, there is merely a right to be informed, which um, is pretty um, much of a very low level form of um, public participation. While at the other end of the spectrum, participants, participants have full decision-making discretion and they can expect to be to have their decisions implemented. And in the middle somewhere you find consultation, which is what the South African regulatory framework is largely fixated on. So this screen, um, using the IAP2 spectrum format, um, I've outlined uh, the respective levels of public participation that are required in, ter required in terms of, of the various statutes. Uh, regulations and guidelines that deal with applications for rights, permits, licenses, and um, um, the, all, all the various permitting streams in, in South Africa. This slide lists the, um, the respective levels of public participation that's required if you look at the, um, the tick boxes on the right of your screen. So obviously the green arrows indicate, or the, the green ticks indicate what is what is uh, required, red is we're not quite there yet, and where I placed question marks, you know, you could possibly veer into that level if, um, if, if a robust process is, is undertaken. So with the exception of applications for um, environmental authorization in terms of the newly amended EIA regulations, and possibly also consultation during social impact assessments and water use license applications. The overarching goal of public participation in South Africa is to, to consult. The goal of these consultation processes, according to the IAP spectrum, is to obtain public feedback on analysis, alternatives and decisions. Um, the corresponding promise to the public is that they'll be kept informed and that their concerns and aspirations will be listened to and that they should expect feedback on how their input influenced the decision. So I'm sure you'll agree that's a relatively low level of, um, of actual influence on, on a final decision. In relation to the 11 June uh, amendments to the EIA regulations, a proponent is now required to obtain written consent from landowners or persons in control of the land where the proposed mining related activities are planned. This consent must be obtained before an application for environmental authorization is submitted to the competent authority. Before the amendments, before the 11 June amendments, uh, Regulation 39.2b created a special exclusion for applications that related to mining. So now, um, as such, Regulation 39.1 now creates a qualified consent 
consent requirement because persons required to give consent are the, those who own or control land, which obviously excludes many mining affected communities and those who reside directly adjacent to the proposed mining development footprint who may be severely impacted by proposed developments. So as such, the IP level of empower doesn't fully come into play as a result of this latest amendment. So the only instance, if you look at the bottom of the screen, um, the only instant, int instance where consent to a proposed land use, such as mining is required from mining affected communities, is when the provisions of appeal row come into play. So even though this act has been on the statute book since 1996 with an annual extension, um, it was either ignored or it was interpreted in a manner that permitted the MPRDA to prevail. However, through the court's purpose of interpretation of the appeal right in Baleni and Maledu, it is now clear that the requirement of this act must be fulfilled prior to granting of a, a, a mineral right in terms of the MPRDA. The courts in both Baleni and Maledu accepted that FPIC, as expressed in international law, is applicable when interpreting a pilra in the context of application for mineral rights. By requiring consent, as opposed to mere consultation, the pilra has enhanced protection afforded to specific mining affected communities, as it strengthens their position to negotiate with mining companies. In fact, it could even afford them the right to veto a mining development. As such, in instances where a pillar is applicable, the full IAP spectrum comes into play if the community in question chooses to oppose mining. So, in order to realize or advance environmental justice, as noted by um, Professor Mercott, um, one requires a keen focus on procedural elements that require equal participation in environmental decision-making so as to respond to unjust living conditions and the unjust distribution of environmental benefits and burdens in society. By requiring public participation in the form of consultation, the law theoretically pursues environmental justice in a procedural sense so as to facilitate environmental justice in a substantive or distributional sense. However, because public participation is often treated as no more than a tick box exercise and communities needs are not taken seriously, environmental justice in both procedural and substantive sense is frequently undermined. Given that FBIC requires a full disclosure of relevant information prior to decisions being made, it can advance the procedural and substantive dimensions of environmental justice. Full disclosure typically includes a financial assessment of potential impacts and externalities that are frequently absorbed by mining affected communities or by the environment. To bring about much needed change, Carinho, who herself is an indigenous person um, from Peru, argues that FPIC in contrast to consultation could facilitate environmental justice in a procedural and substantive sense, given that it is geared to safeguard material interest, cultures and ecological values, and to minimize harm through a process of engagement that is based on respect and equality leading to negotiated outcomes, which includes the right to reject developments they don't gain community acceptance based on informed choice. Through FPIC, prospective developers are required to engage with mining affected communities in a respectful manner without coercion or intimidation from either the state or the developer with sufficient information about potential impacts to enable those that will be directly affected to decide if they will allow the development to proceed or not. Where an agreement is reached, such terms of an agreement become binding and enforceable, advancing procedural environmental justice by recognizing the legitimate interests of mining affected communities and giving them a seat at the table. In this manner, cultural and natural diversity can be prioritized during a decision making process. This in turn could lead to more favorable outcomes for mining affected communities 
as giving them if effect to substantive environmental justice. In the context of South Africa's EIA public participation, if it could be achieved by expanding on the latest amendment to the EIA regulations, which now requires consent prior to applications for environmental authorization, the meaning of consent as contemplated in, the, in, in regulation 39 should however be made clear. The EIA regulations should incorporate a procedure that must be followed where consent in terms of regulation 39 is waived, withheld or not secured for whatever reason. We consent in terms of the now amended EIA uh, regulation 39 must be secured from holders of informal land rights in terms of a PILRA or any other legislation that Parliament may enact as required in terms of section 25, 6 and um, uh, subject section 9 of the Constitution um, or any community that observes a system of indigenous, uh, indigenous law as contemplated in section 211 of the Constitution. Such consent must be secured in accordance with the principles of EFPIC, where large scale adverse environmental or social impacts are anticipated, it stands to reason that environmental justices could materialize. In these circumstances, public partition, participation that includes an FPIC requirement could help secure environmental justice for these mining affected communities. So thank you everybody for your um, participation and for listening to me and um, I'll take more questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ashla, yes, the name is Ashla. Uh, earlier, we were supposed to have Chitsa Machaka. I want to believe that wherever she is, she has sorted out her connection and sound problems. Let's go back to Chitsa. Chitsa, are you ready? Can you share your screen? Chitsa Machaka? Are you with us? We cannot hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Chesa, please unmute yourself. We can see your face, but we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. We can't hear you. Ms. Machaka, uh, perhaps put your video off and that should help to enhance the audio. Ms. Machaka? Ms. Machaka, can you read out your presentation without sharing the screen? Can you present without necessarily sharing the screen? It might create a problem. Can you hear us? Maybe we need to get an indication from you whether you can hear us or not. Otherwise, we have to proceed without you. Uh, Dr. Lufenia, she says she can hear us. Can you talk to her? Uh, yes, I am directly talking to her on the chat box. She can, she can hear us. Okay, but now she needs to speak to us so that we hear her. Uh, perhaps we can, we can proceed with the discussion while I try to help her on the side uh, to try to figure out what's the problem. Okay, thank you Will for you that, John. Thank, thank you, Dr. Um, can I then invite my co-chair, um, Tanya, to take us through the questions or comments that we have 
on the chat box. Tanya? Thank you, Doctor. Uh, yes, that's in order. Um, so firstly, we had a comment uh, for Isabella, and this was from um, uh, Dr. Murcott. A lovely presentation. Um, and she suggests that if you haven't already read uh, Mike Bishop's work on Concorse, it might be of value. Um, in the chat, I haven't seen any other questions that were posed. Um, I see that Melandri Steenkamp uh, also had a comment for Ursula saying lovely presentation. Um, but I have a question for Isabella. Um, uh, I, I just have two, two short comments and then a question. Um, the first comment is um, that when discussing this type of, um, of uh, traditional knowledge, um, particularly within the context of patents, etc., cetera, um, it's very important to make it clear exactly what type of traditional knowledge you're referring to. Um, the, the kind of traditional knowledge that is generally the subject of, for instance, a patent application is what is more commonly known as associated traditional knowledge or associated TK. And it's basically a TK that has direct relevance for the way in which biological resources, in particular genetic resources, are used. So it's very different from, uh, for instance, customary uses of biodiversity in general, uh, for instance, um, you know, the customary ways in which fishing takes place. Um, so it's very important uh, in a presentation like this to, to sort of make it clear exactly what type of um, tech, uh, traditional knowledge you're referring to. Um, and then my second comment, uh, I wondered if you've had a chance to consider um, the Protection, Promotion, Development and Management of Indigenous Knowledge Act. Um, this is Act 6 of 2019. Um, it is a South African Act. Um, and I think it answers a lot of the, the, the questions that you raised when you, when you suggested that um, there is a need for perhaps a, a sui generis form of protection for um, this type of uh, traditional knowledge. Um, the Act isn't operational yet, but it has been enacted. So, so go and have a look at that and see if it addresses some of those um, some of those questions that, that you raised. And then I have a question. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in your presentation, the discussions that are taking place, um, particularly within the context of WIPO at the international level. Um, I don't know to what extent you've gone into, because it's, it's broadly accepted that those negotiations have stalled. Um, you, you correctly identified that they began in, in around 2010, but, um, to a large extent, it's accepted amongst the, the sort of community that it's that it has stalled. Um, have you considered or have you looked at some of the reasons why, particularly um, the, the very popular opinion that one of the reasons why those negotiations uh, in order to, at the international level, try and provide a stronger level of protection to uh, traditional knowledge holders, um, is that precisely because the indigenous and local communities within the developing countries that are represented at those negotiations don't actually want the kind of um, protection that, that we're envisaging, you know, the, the sort of using legal measures, using regulatory frameworks to try and protect this type of knowledge. Um, uh, and, and like I say, it's um, largely accepted that a lot of these communities themselves don't actually want that kind of protection. So my question to you is, have you considered that and what is your view on that? Okay, hello. Um, Hi. Thank you so much for the, the first points. Um, I, I will definitely check, um, um, see that, that act. Um, and, and be more specific with regards to the traditional knowledge. Um, so so what kept on occurring to me um, with this research was, first of all, that indigenous communities um, are not looking to sell the knowledge um, in terms of, of, of what it could be used um, in with commercial purposes, it's it's not as if they they are the starting point um, where where potential actors can come and, and speak to them. It's more of the other way around, um, 
which is which is like a, a kind of a one sided transaction that doesn't actually speak to like whether they want to share the knowledge in the first place. Um, and then I, I thought like, so it's in terms of whether they, they believe um, whether, whether such communities want protection um, from the law. And I think that, that it's based in the fact that the law is very much revolving around a commercial purpose um, with the knowledge. It's, it's, it's not, um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not catering to, to different kinds of needs. It's, um, it's, it's, it's monetary and, and that may not be able to, to quantify the, um, or to be able to quantify the kind of um, production of knowledge that has happened, um, the value in that. Yeah, I think that's, that's all I can say to that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we then have a question for Ursula from um, Professor Patterson. It says, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, your paper deals with communities affected by environmental decision making in the mining sector. Could one draw a distinction between uh, different categories of mining affected communities, such as those with informal land rights, those with formal land rights, and those with no land rights? If so, uh, should each be accorded the same or differentiated opportunities to participate? Uh, that's a question for you, Ursula. Thank you, uh, Professor Patterson. That's a fascinating and tricky question to answer. Um, I think that it's a slippery slope when you start categorizing communities of people in the country. Um, the, best, the best way to actually, you know, if you want to categorize something, I think you should stick to categorizing the impacts. And um, obviously, the, the, the more... You know, so for, for argument's sake, you could you could have a, a low impact, a proposed development that will very have very low impact, which is directly adjacent to a very affluent community in a wonderful um, golf housing estate. So um, you will then probably not afford similar, um, you know, have to follow a similar ethnic type process with in in in, in that scenario. Whereas on the other hand, you would you would have um, you typically would have um, high environmental impacts with potentially hugely invasive activities such as an open cast gold mine next to um, a community of uh, shack dwellers who um, might not necessarily have uh, formal recognition that they've been living on a particular um, plot of land for a, a protracted period of time. In that scenario, you would I, I personally think you would have to um, follow an FPIC process with them in order to negotiate an arrangement that is beneficial to them. So um, when you're looking at um, creating a distinction between various types of uh, land right holders, I think it, in my personal view, I think it's safer to focus on the level of the impact that, that that proposed development would have on a specific community. Um, I don't think that you should just limit it to the holders of informal land rights, um, because that, that act has fairly limited ac application and unfortunately resources find themselves all over the country under the ground. So you, you know, I, I personally don't think that one should, that one should limit it only to, to to, to the people who, have, who, who hold rights under, under the EPIL room. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Um, whilst we're waiting for Tanya to come back, let me ask two questions. I have one question for Isabella and one question for Ashla. 
Um, let me start with Isabella. Um, is there an appetite for the integration of indigenous knowledge and environmental law, particularly on communities? If there isn't such an appetite, uh, what can be done? That's my question to Isabella. I will then ask um, Ashla after Isabella has responded. Okay, hello. Um, so regarding an appetite um, for this integration, I am I'm, I'm aware of uh, many indigenous communities around the world calling for a, a, a greater um, facilitation of their views and um, a, a greater consideration of, of, of what they have to offer um, as, as authority with regards to conservation or um, um, indigenous resource management. Um, but if, 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 as you say, that there's not um, so much of a, of a, of a want to combine these two um, sources of law, I think that there should at least, at the very least, be a, a, a very inclusive public participation process that, um, that helps to, to frame the law within a better perspective. Um, um, yeah, I mean, personally, fr from my point of view, I think that Indigenous communities are, are, are practically our last hope with regards to, to managing natural resources and the environment. And um, they, such communities are, are some of the only um, kinds of bodies that could, that could be guardians um, of of the environment, and that could that could could be could be um, utilized for the kinds of rights that are connected um, within the culture to the environment um, as as a means to protect the environment. Um, yeah, that's that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question to Eshla. <clears throat> Eshla. Um, it is common knowledge nowadays that our environmental decision making is clouded, is mad with politics more than any other thing, from local communities to the executives or organs of state at large. And at the same time, we have very important court decisions that are trying to steer the ship in the right direction, yet there is minimal transformation or change on the part of decision makers or even coming to the party, if I may put it that way, by our decision makers. How can we get this right? Can we start with communities or start with the executives or start with the law? Or are the courts our only hope? What is your view on this? Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think the way we are approaching it at the moment appears to be a multi-pronged approach where you've got community activists, NGOs, obviously the courts playing their role, um, and various other organizations, all, all the way up to lender organizations that are now starting to uh, pay attention to, to these issues. So, but ultimately we need to, we need to find a way that we can actually, <clears throat> excuse me, that we, can, that we can get that message through to parliament so that we could perhaps start addressing 
sorry, that we can start addressing the laws that are on the statute books. And um, I think it would go a long way to, to make a huge difference if we could bring, bring more stringent um, regulation in place to govern who actually decides what happens on, 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 um, on, on a particular plot of land. So um, to answer your question, it's, you know, we, we all have a role to play. But in my view, I think if we, can, if we can get to the point where we can actually start changing, you know, demanding a little bit more from the ultimate decision makers, because it appears that a lot of the problems, the problems are actually arising from, from um, inappropriate decisions being made. And then people who don't have the, the wherewithal or the means to fight it, to, um, to be able to, to, to fight back against these decisions. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, okay, fine. Um, I'm covered then, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lavinia. Uh, yes, thank you, doctor. Um, uh, now over to Dr. Murcott. Hi, thanks for both the presentations. I thought they were really great. Um, I think one of the big challenges that um, Isabella, your topic raises is um, the ideology of capitalism and how you know we can't use a, a capitalist solution to solve a, a, a capitalist generated problem. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to hear more about the act, Tanya, that you mentioned. <laughs> um, I, I hadn't heard of it and I think it could be quite important and I wonder if it, it could possibly also be important for Ursula's research. Um, I'm not sure what, what its scope is, but it, it sounds exciting. For Isabella, I think qu a quick comment about how rights are, are not necessarily the appropriate legal tool for um, indigenous communities. Um, and what Peter Burden is, is arguing um, at the moment in, in in quite an interesting way is for obligations towards nature rather than rights of nature. And um, he links his argument to indigenous communities. Uh, he's, he's published something in 2020, Law and Critique, that if your research is ongoing, you might find interesting. Um, and the, the idea is that I suppose in the context of your research, people who are wanting to claim intellectual property rights in respect of um, indigenous knowledge would have enhanced obligations towards communities. And that take, could take some of the burden off communities. Um, and, and then in, res in response to Ursula's paper, I just think it, it's brilliant how you've managed to update your research with reference to recent legal developments in, in the EIA regulation. So well done. I think that much more can be made of that change in the EIA regulations as being a really positive step in the right direction um, in terms of of shifting the politics, Dr. Lafenia pointed to, to politics. Um, I think what free prior informed consent can do is shift the power balance and the more um, opportunity uh, communities have to, to withhold or express their consent, the more they become powerful actors in these important decisions. So the more they're recognized. And I think that can have a, an important role, but I agree with you that it's a non-state and a state actor issue uh, and the, the private sector can also play a, a, an important role, but just well done on, on your really fantastic presentations, both of you. Thank you, Dr. Mercott. Um, I see Professor Duplessis has offered to uh, present uh, on Tutsa's behalf. Um, and then has proposed that Chidza can then uh, answer questions in the chat itself, uh, since she appears to still be having some technical issues. Um, so uh, if, if Professor Duplessis is willing to proceed, then I think we can move, move on to that, uh, onto that presentation. Is that in order, Professor Duplessis?
Uh, yes, um, I can do if you can see the screen. We'll go presenter mode. Yes, we can see the screen. Okay. Uh, so, Ms. Machaka, if you can then um, just get ready to answer whatever questions anyone might have, we'll pose them in the chat and then if you can then respond in the chat. Okay, Tieta wants to talk about the legal governance of the Commons in promoting social ecological resilience in the South African site of the Khalakhadi Transfrontier Conservation Area. Um, so she wanted to talk about the common social ecological resilience and ecological systems, adaptive governance, and then a brief analysis of the legal framework pertaining to the commons, and then come to conclusions and recommendations. So what is a transfrontier conservation area? If we look at SADIC protocol, it is defines a component of a large ecological region that straddles the boundaries of two or more countries encompassing one or more protected areas as well as multiple resource use areas. She focused on the Khalakhari Transfrontier Conservation Areas, um, where the Kumani Sun and Mir communities submitted the land claim some years ago. The land was restituted to them. And one of the reasons that they did so was the loss of their natural resources uh, when the park was proclaimed. The land was awarded. It was one of the first land claims that was awarded to communities. And um, it was uh, then functioned as a joint contract park. It was jointly managed by the South African National Parks of the time, as well as a conservation authority, the Kumani Sun and the Mir communities through a joint management board. There were several challenges on the South African side of the Khalakhadi Transfrontier um, conservation areas. Um, for example, um, there were group conflict between the communities um, over the so-called traditionalist and modern summer over the utilization of the land. The traditionalists wanted the land to be used for traditional purpose, such as hunting, the gathering of medicinal and food plants, while the modernists want to use the land for livestock and housing. And the absence of indicators of good governance, accountability, and the perception of benefit sharing amongst the Sun and Mir communities um, led to some um, challenges in this regard. And then, of course, there are various other impacts, such as uh, flooding um, on old droughts on this side. So she addressed the study from a commons perspective. Um, and she used Ostrom's governing principles for what is a commons. And there were seven or eight design principles that she used to establish whether the Khalakhadi TFCAs can be regarded as a commons. She also referred to socio-ecological resilience that involves the interconnected nature of social and ecological ecosystems in terms of which human interact with um, nature to foster resilience. Um, the socio-ecological ecosystems were characterized by resource systems, resource units, um, and resource users. And therefore she said that socio-ecological resilience involves the ability of socio-ecological links ecosystems to absorb, adapt, and transform in the space of change. Adaptive governance um, she referred to as the placentic form governance that extend the ambit of governance across multiple uh, overlapping levels of control, such as government, local community, civil society, and private sector, and is regarded to be able to facilitate resilience in socio-ecological systems. And then she asked, how she would it relate to the South African side of the Khalakhari TFCAs under discussion? So, um, I'm going to move to where she discussed the nexus between the common socio-ecological resilience and adaptive governance. And she said the first interface of the common socio-ecological resilience and adaptive governance nexus is where the common socio-ecological resilience and adaptive governance elements apply to confined spaces, such as the Khalakhari TFCA and its surrounding areas with resource managers whose rights may overlap at multiple levels. The second interface um, then would then be the interventions by the social systems which constitute resource 
taxes and members of the governance structures actions on land and it affects the ability of the ecosystems on the shared land to be to adapt to any external pressures while their structure and functions are maintained. And then the third interface will be um, that the nature of relations among those in the social system, um, that is the resource stakeholders, impacts on promoting socio-ecological resilience and ultimately adaptive governance. So she then had uh, investigated the Kalari Heritage Park Agreement, the Kalari Hemsworth National Park Management Plan, as well as international and regional documents relating to um, the common socio-ecological resilience, et cetera, as well as South African legislation that's mentioned here. Then she illustrated how the Commons principles, socio-ecological elements are reflected in the management plan of the contract part, as well as African regional law and South African legislation. And you will see that in some instances using then the design principles of Ostrom, um, there are correlations, but with regard to collective choice agreements, um, that's not well done as well as monitoring and the graduated sanctions that should take place. They are also not um, very well developed nested enterprises as um, Ostrom relate to that. And with regard to socio-ecological resilience, it seems that we are also still lacking. It's only the capacity um, of a linked socio-ecological system to adapt in the face of disturbance and maintain functions that um, is well developed. I'm going to go to the conclusion recommendations. She then um, recommended that the integrated approach towards the commons and socio-ecological resilience should provide for adaptive governance and a nexus of these concepts within the commons. On the short term, the NEMA, the NEMBA, and the NEMPA has to be amended to contain provisions to ensure meaningful participation of local community members with respect to any development that should take place within the commons. In the medium, in the medium term, um, she should move towards adaptive governance in the commons within the Khalakhari TFCA, and it's proposed that the household forum be established to ensure meaningful participation amongst all stakeholders, including the local community members. And then in the long term, she proposes that adaptive governance as a means of governance that may encourage adaptation to change the commons in the face of various challenges should be adapted. Um, and I think that's enough for the moment. And you're welcome to ask her questions in this regard. Uh, thank you, Professor Duplessis. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Does anyone have a question they would like to pose to Ms. Mashaka? Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Patterson. I'm going to put my camera on because uh, I I'm personally so tired of, of talking at little, little dots on a screen or names on a screen. Um, thanks so much, Wilhelmine, for the presentation and, and uh, Chedza for the paper. Chedza, my, my question to you is, I, I'm fascinated by this area, particularly regulating the commons. And if one's looking at that um, transfer to a conservation area, and particularly the South African side, it seems to be founded on the co-management framework, which is the policy framework which the government has decided to use to particularly resolve issues like managing the commons in our large national parks when those are subject to land restitution, such as, such as what happened in the Kruger National Park. So I'm wondering in your research, have you looked at the, the, the national co-management framework and interrogated that because many of the critiques which you raise around the, con the commons and South Africa's approach to try and regulate the commons through its legislative framework um, seem to be, could similarly be placed against South Africa's national co-management framework. So I'm just interested in your research if you've, if you've interrogated that national co-management framework as as an approach to regulating the commons in that particular transfrontier conservation area. Uh, thank you, Professor Patterson. 
Um, so Ms. Mashaka, if you can uh, respond to Professor Patterson's question in the chat, uh, and then I'll relay your response to the attendees. In the meantime, does anyone else have any other questions uh, for any of our speakers? I see Prof. Patterson's hand is still up. Prof. Patterson, is that a legacy hand or a, or a new hand? It's definitely a legacy. I'm, I'm, there's so many buttons here. I'm about to turn it off. Okay. There we go. I have a feeling that's a very big question to type an answer to in the chat. So perhaps <laughs> she can she can just uh, yeah she can relay it by email to me afterwards. Uh, thank you for that. I think that's a good suggestion. Um, and I think, Ms. Mashaka, if you're busy typing, uh, please continue. Um, in the meantime, I would like to hand back to uh, my co, Dr. Lafenia, um, who will do the closing. Um, should I take over, Tanya? Uh, yes, please, Dr. Lafenia, you can do the closing of the session. Okay, thank you. Um, colleagues and our dearest students, let me take this opportunity to, to thank all the three presenters and Professor Velamin for stepping in when the going was tough. Thank you very much for that. And we had very thought provoking presentations from all the three students um, this morning. And let me also thank those who post questions and those who post positive comments on our chat box on the side. And last but not least, let me take the opportunity to thank our prestigious sponsors, Judah, and Penguin, your sponsorship and your support is always appreciated. Thank you very much and keep up your good work. It must not end today with the ELA 2021, but with other events, other projects. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let me call upon uh, Hermari or Tanya or John to do or to give us an announcement or two. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Lefania and Tanya for uh, doing such a wonderful job um, for this session. Uh, just a quick announcement. Um, I saw that Professor Lamin uh, posted that on, on the chat box a bit earlier. Just inviting the students to nominate uh, one student or they can nominate themselves uh, to be the student uh, representatives on the ESCO. So what that entails it's that we will have, they will be able to attend um, a monthly meetings of, of the ESCO and be able to assist uh, with organizing the event. And having been a student um, in the ESCO, that is such a wonderful opportunity uh, that opens so many doors and gives you an opportunity to uh, build up very good connections at the early stage. So I would really encourage students to Either you nominate someone or you, you nominate yourself. I will go for nominating myself. So that's the first one. Uh, so please um, do uh, go ahead and nominate yourself. Secondly, um, I would want to also invite uh, the student also to remember to join us later today on our last session uh, in our program. It's session number five where um, there will be award awarding of prizes for the best um, presenter um, and then the 
student as a competition winner that will be announced that day. And then we have a student activity that will be taking place during that time where we have uh, two uh, speakers that will be uh, talking to us um, in the afternoon. So I'm inviting you to join us. Um, and that all from us for now, um, we will be seeing you again at 4 p.m. today on session session four. Please enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.